I am never going to emotionally recover from this. I wish I was a wall. I wish I was a wall. I'm not saying I would give my firstborn child to have Faye push me up against a wall and kiss me like that. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying I would give my firstborn child to have Faye push me up against a wall and kiss me like that. that that's all. That's all. You can get away with those types of jokes when you're an evil lesbian hag, such as myself, about me. So I looked up Faye's birthday and it turns out she's a Libra and that explains the level of hundred charm and the trail of broken hearts wherever she goes. Not that I have personal experience with Libra women or anything like that. The tenderness and emotional depth of this episode. Unparalleled. Portrait of a lady on fire. Found bold and shaking. Celine Siam has been real quiet since this episode came out. Highlights of this episode. Nung with that slicked back hair. Oh my god. Looking like a work of art at her own gallery. You walk in to that gallery and she's the art. Hot Doctor makes yet another appearance. My hopes and dreams for Dr. Wan and Nung sailing that sweet sweet ship across the ocean live on. I'm still in the game. This screenshot I took I feel like it will come in handy at some point. And the highest of lights Nung leaning over Anne Nung and radiating the most intense lesbian energy I have ever seen. When Nung placed her hand against that wall I evaporated. I'm, I'm, I was gone. I'm not even here right now. This is a hologram. Help me lesbians. You are my only hope. Hi guys, welcome to a video and in today's video I'm just going to be reviewing episode 2 of season 2 of Blank the Series. I'm a little bit more on time with my review this time, but also not really. Progress, a ray of light in the darkness of this channel and in my life. Don't get used to it. Long time subscribers know to keep their expectations on the floor. They are my long suffering wife who I love very much but I don't always treat her as well as I should. Mm. Okay. Let's get into it. So this episode opens like a gentle breeze on a summer's day. Like fresh laundry. Like freshly baked cinnamon rolls. The soft cheek rubs. The smiles. The starry eyes. Nung and An Nung are in their wholesome honeymoon era. It's though episode one was just a bad dream. As usual, Nung's expressions convey so much, and you can see that she's got it bad. She is lost in the lesbian source. And then, like a lightning bolt, out of nowhere, An Nung hits Nung with the are we together now question. Yes, the famous what are we inquiry. And you can see the little people who live inside Nung's mind doing mental gymnastics and quickly trying to process not only how to best answer this, but the consequences of what her answer may lead to. As we've established, Nung is not a woman of words. She's more of a I'll show you how I feel type of person, you know? And An Nung, upon seeing this quite visible gay panic, quickly follows up with the, you can answer this question later, there, there's no pressure. But after the level of drama that went down in episode one, Nung is probably shaking in her boots that one wrong move, one wrong word, could send them spiraling. And just to double check that she's really in the clear, she asks An Nung if she's mad at her. To which An Nung responds, who could be mad at you? <laughs> Babes, you. You could be mad at her. You were mad at her for at least 50% of the last episode. But it's fine, you know, they're, they're in their soft, tender era and all of that's behind them for now. Then An Nung drops the U-Haul suggestion, a bold but classic lesbian move. No pun intended. But this is just a bit too much too soon for Nung, who is like, let's consider your grandmother in this equation and just think about things properly here, as she's the responsible one. And so as a compromise, An Nung then presses for sleepovers, which Nung concedes to in in her own vague way and they settle on that for now. I can't blame An Nung for trying to lock it down. If Nung was my woman, I would be doing the same. I'd be doing the most. Also, we have to remember this is An Nung's first love. The hormones, the chemicals, they're going crazy. Rational thinking, not, not a thing. So it's very understandable why she's just kind of like rushing 10 steps ahead. I mean, she's just head over heels and, you know, 
know, she's she's lost. She's lost in the lesbian source. We're also really blessed with the visuals this episode. It's giving tender. It's giving Bet and Tina from the L word opening credits. Next thing, Nung and An Nung rock up at An Nung's grandmother's house, only to find she's undergone a personality transplant. <laughs> the bitter, abusive, traumatised grandmother of yesterday is long gone and in her place a shiny, new, loving, calm and smiling woman appears. <laughs> the writer's room have given her an upgrade. But of course she isn't aware that Nung is laying it down on her granddaughter, so all of that positive progress could quickly be undone if she finds out the truth. It did amuse me how Nung was just like, she was at mine doing her project until late. Nung is the project. Anyway, An Nung attempts some quite risky PDAs at that moment and Nung puts a stop to it because she's not trying to risk it all at this very moment. She's enjoying the shiny new grandma update and doesn't feel like ruining it you know? But again, this highlights how An Nung is slightly more naive about the reality of their situation and so is therefore more carefree with her affection because of it. If they were discovered at this point, it's Nung who would face all of the backlash and very likely be accused of taking advantage and so on. Even though we know that's not the case, that's probably not how other people would see it. And of course, if there were consequences for An Nung as a result of their relationship, Nung would also feel really guilty about that too. It's complicated and that's why this show is crazy. Then An Nung manages to convince her grandmother to allow her to have more sleepovers with Nung. For academic reasons only, of course. An Nung looks so uncomfortable in this scene. Everything that she's feeling is just so plainly written on her face. But luckily for her, you know, An Nung's grandmother is not a mind reader. So, back at the palace, Nung introduces An Nung to Auntie Nim not as her lover, but as her friend's daughter. First of all, Auntie Nim looks like she already knows everything. This is the look of a woman who knows too much. And second of all, An Nung is understandably hurt by this introduction, because of course she doesn't understand why their relationship needs to be hidden. She thinks it's something that should be celebrated. And while she acknowledges how Nung feels, and the reason why Nung doesn't want to come out about them, it doesn't make it any less painful for her. I think the difference in Nung and An Nung's perspective over their relationship visibility is a recurring theme throughout this episode. But to be fair, Nung has explained to An Nung how she feels and why she feels that way. So it's not a communication issue, it's just a difference of opinion on on what has been communicated. Like obviously Nung needs time, but because this season is only six episodes long, everything is being rushed along more than it would be normally. But we know normalcy doesn't apply to this show anyway, so okay. Then we're launched into a Beauty and the Beast AU as Nung shows Ang Nung around the palace. There's a library, there's forbidden rooms, all that's missing is a rose in a glass dome. And in the library, and Nung explains to Nung that she understands that she isn't ready to make the leap yet in terms of moving in together and coming out whilst giving her some quite serious puppy dog eyes. But it's clear to me that she was saying this to just try and appear reasonable and to try and reassure Nung when in truth she actually feels quite resentful about it. Her actions and emotions throughout this entire episode very much suggests that she feels hurt and frustrated by having to hide. I mean when Nung goes to kiss An Nung in this scene, An Nung swerves away, which I felt was slightly more passive aggressive than it was playful. It was just like if you're not going to give me what I want, I'm not going to give you what you want, that kind of thing. However, Nung 
telling her I'll go to your room later did add several years to my lifespan. I just needed to mention that. Again, I do understand a lot of Anne Nung's frustration and where she's coming from. She's young and she's in love. She doesn't want to be closeted. Anne hidden away and she thought they'd at least be able to be open and free with each other at the palace. But they're not, which is extra disappointing because it's the one place where there was potential for that to be a thing. It's a complicated situation and neither one of them is necessarily in the wrong. They both have their reasons for the way that they're feeling and behaving. Another interesting theme in this episode is the exploration of Nung's inner turmoil and grief through the location of the palace. For example, Anne Nung spending time with Nung in her family home where there are rooms and items associated with Nung's past open up conversations between them that they may not have had otherwise. And Anne Nung is able to connect with Nung on a much deeper level because of it. We also get a sense of just how heavy Nung's grief and guilt is is in relation to what happened to Kun Song, especially because there are constant reminders of Song inside the palace. And this is something that hasn't really been explored much up until now. It's like being in the palace really allows Nung to unpack and deal with a lot of feelings and thoughts that she'd had bottled up. Fast forward to the mall where Nung and An Nung are buying equipment for An Nung's new podcast. She's a podcast bro. And who else bumps into them there than Dr. Wan? It's another win for the lesbians. And by lesbians, I mean me. And not only does Hot Doctor slide up to Nung, making eyes at her right in front of An Nung's salad, to add insult to injury, she also asks if An Nung is Nung's niece and An Nung is none too pleased. So Nung just stands there awkwardly, caught between two women, what's new, until Dr. Wan eventually excuses herself, and An Nung proceeds to have it out with Nung about what just happened. She expresses her jealousy, and Nung drops some precious Dr. Wan and Nung lore upon us, where she tells An Nung that her and Dr. Wan used to hang out a while ago, still hoping for a flashback scene of those hangouts. Mm -mm -mm. But of course, they're just friends now. But An Nung continues pouting so Nung takes her to the bathroom, Jenny and Marina style, and it's here she leans over her and radiates the most intense lesbian energy I have ever witnessed. I don't know how An Nung managed to stay conscious through that stance, through that kiss, and through that love confession. I would have gone into cardiac arrest on the spot. I would have melted from the heat into nothingness. I would be pregnant homosexual and deceased all at once. <laughs> Sounds like fun, but the magic of intense lesbian energy does manage to make An Nung stop pouting. And I have to say, I think their chemistry in this scene is like the best I've ever seen it. It was quite palpable. However, in their bathroom debrief, An Nung does try to ban Nung from seeing the hot doctor, which on the one hand is kind of ridiculous to try and ban your other half from seeing someone. Like, if somebody wants to cheat on you, they're just gonna cheat on you, right? But on the other hand, her jealousy is very much intertwined with the fact that Nung is hiding their relationship, so from an outside perspective, Nung still appears to be single, you know, which is obviously going to be an issue for An Nung. So I get where An Nung is coming from, but at the same time, personally, I have to disagree. I think Nung and Dr. Wan should go out quite a lot actually. Back at the palace and Nung and An Nung are in their domestic bliss era, complete with pyjama visuals and I have to say, even in pyjamas, Nung is looking like a midnight snack. And I think what's refreshing about this episode is throughout it, we get to see how Nung and An Nung work together as a couple in their normal day-to-day -day lives. Instead of having to watch them, you know, consistently deal with miscommunication, 
miscommunications and drama. They're allowed to breathe for once and so are we. <laughs> for example, we get to see An Nung doing things like making business suggestions for Nung's gallery. We see them cuddling up on the sofa reading and just generally spending time together and making each other happy. And there's a lot of softness and heart in those smaller moments, which is just lovely to watch. But of course the miscommunications and the drama is what actually drives the story forward, right? So you win some, you lose some. Insert generic saying here. Nung also gives An Nung a bracelet in this episode, which is significant in terms of Nung expressing what An Nung means to her and a sign of her commitment. Again, Nung is someone who shows how she feels as opposed to verbally expressing it. So this scene says a lot about what An Nung means to her. Nung then rocks up on a date, Mon Sam edition, and Sam wants the 411. She wants the lesbian gossip. A relatable queen. And An Nung confides in the both of them that she's having doubts about her relationship with An Nung. She's not sure if she's doing the right thing. And we been knew this, but this conversation with Sam is important because Sam reminds Nung her own happiness should be what she's focusing on and that life's far too short to, you know, spend all your time worrying about what other people think, which I I very much think Nung needed to hear and interestingly this conversation is connected to what happened to Nung's sister Song because Song obviously died at a young age and didn't get the opportunity to live her life in the way that she wanted whereas Nung has that chance and if anything what happened to Song should be a reminder to Nung to hold on to her happiness and enjoy it instead of worrying about what everybody else will think of it. And Nung is also very much in possessive mode throughout this entire episode and expresses to Nung that she's tired of people checking her out. But girl, that's what happens when your woman looks like a three course meal. People be hungry. <laughs> Fast forward to another round of cute visuals and a bonus domestic bliss on the sofa session. And I have to say, I was greatly amused at the blank novel not only making an appearance, the Inception. But An Nung also described it as really famous. Ooh, she's a one woman PR machine. Was also amused by An Nung explaining to Nung what a sapphic novel is. Nung is a sapphic novel. <laughs> then Shet turns up out of the blue and sees if anybody wants to accompany him to a meal with his parents. And the expression on Nung's face in this scene, mmm. A picture paints a thousand words. And whilst he's there, he picks up the copy of Blank and soon realizes it's a lesbian novel. It's gay. But before he can jump into a lecture, Nung shuts him down. And in very polite terms, you know, suggests that he GTFO. She wears the trousers in their relationship. In fact, she wears trousers in all her relationships. And that is why we first. She's An Nung's bodyguard against homophobia. I want one. Next thing, there's a double date happening, Sisters Edition, where Sam is still trying to get the tea. And luckily An Nung spills it for her. This does give Nung a mini heart attack, but girl, Sam already knows what's going on. She just like wants you to say it. Nung is very unsuccessfully trying to be coy. Girl, just give it up. You're too lost in the lesbian source to play it cool you know? Then we get a bonus cute Mon Sam crumb where they're having a debrief about their earlier double date. Sam thinks they're a good match but Mon thinks their age gap might be an issue down the line because An Nung has so much more to experience with life. And I think Sam takes this slightly personally because she then says if anyone is going to leave anyone, it will probably be Nung and reminds Mon that they also have an age gap between them too. Mon then reassures her and Sam remarks that An Nung looks at Kun Nung the same way that Mon looks at her and that's how she knows they're the perfect match. It's 
It's a beautiful gay parallel. And then here comes the emotional tsunami. Nung and An Nung are in bed together, but Nung wakes up from a bad dream thinking of Song. So she goes into another room to grieve privately. I say this in every review, but the way Faye manages to convey so much emotional rawness in her scenes without saying a single word is just incredible. You can really feel the pain that Nung is going through in this scene from Faye's performance. And it's just so engaging to watch. And Nung ends up following Nung into the other room where Nung has a complete breakdown before her, letting all of the guilt and trauma she's had bottled up for so long just spill out. And I have to say, An Nung handles this and comforts her in such a thoughtful and emotionally intelligent way. The speech she gives Nung just really shows her emotional maturity and wisdom beyond her years, which is one of the things I really love about her character. And I think it's really interesting in this scene that An Nung points out that Nung needs to consider her own feelings in relation to the trauma she has because it reiterates what Sam was also telling her earlier. It's all connected. I feel like not only was this scene deeply emotional, but it was a significant moment for their relationship. Because not only does Nung properly let her walls down in front of An Nung, allowing them to connect on a deeper level, but An Nung says that she will always be there for Nung, which really cements their relationship. Then we're transported to Nung's gallery opening and god damn, she looks stunning, mesmerizing. She's fine winery, she's fine whining. The fine is fining, <laughs> she's effervescent. A very small percentage of you might get that joke. The slicked back hair, I am never going to emotionally recover from this look. And much to my delight, the hot doctor is also in attendance at this opening. All I'm saying is they look good next to one another. You know, they complement each other. That's all. But of course, An Nung doesn't see it the way I do and is not happy to see the hot doctor with Nung. Which on the one hand, her jealousy is clearly born out of insecurity about herself and relationship with Nung. And it's not healthy. But on the other hand, she understandably feels frustrated in this situation because her relationship with Nung is being hidden away and she has to watch Nung from the sidelines. So as a result, she's vibrating with jealousy and drinking her feelings away. And Nung helplessly looks on whilst this happens. The next thing, Nung is carrying a drunk An Nung through the door. To be honest, I don't love it when An Nung gets drunk because it always makes her act out. It places a burden of care on Nung and it blurs the line of their interactions a little bit. But we're not watching a Disney movie, so whatever. But anyway, once inside, and Nung starts some drama with Nung over the fact that she spent time talking to Dr. Wan and Nung is trying to put An Nung to bed but she's not interested in going to bed she's interested in trying to physically claim her woman but of course Nung is anxious they might be seen so she tries to stop this she really does try however An Nung persists and Nung's dominant side ends up coming out look once again is this scene a little bit weird. Yes. But is it also hot when Nung puts her hand up against the wall and leans over An Nung in that way? Also yes. The passion in Nung's kissing in that scene has watered all of my crops, fed all of my children and replenished my faith. It was the passion of a thousand burning gay sons. If there's one thing that Nung knows how to do, it's handle another woman, okay? But of course it doesn't last because they are caught in the act by Auntie Nim, who sensed lesbian drama in her spidey senses and came running. Q Nung looking incredibly worried and An Nung looking vaguely out of it and frustrated that her kissing session was interrupted. Understandable. I think from the glimpse we got of of episode three, it looks like Auntie Nim takes an issue with their relationship and doesn't approve. I may have to understand depending on how bad it is. And since we're approaching mid season, I think we should buckle up. And this show is off the wall, so anything could happen at any moment. All I'm saying is we should cherish the domestic bliss crumbs we got in this episode because this show is crazy. <laughs> 
and anything could happen at any moment. Overall, I thought this was an amazing second episode. As usual, Faye and Yoko come through with the good kush performances. There was a lot of emotional depth. And I thought this episode was thoughtful and intelligently written, for the most part. And as always, Noong looked like a three-course meal. And I'm always hungry. I don't know, I don't know. She looked good. You know, the visuals, 11 out of 10. Noong's kissing game, 100 out of 10. Okay guys, I'd love to know what you thought of the second episode of season two of Blank the Series down in the comments section below. Don't forget to subscribe for instant disappointment and I'll see you guys soon. Bye!